Hello everyone, welcome to the, this first edition of CFG Shorties. Uh, the reason for this is because, well, um, Steve wasn't able to be here yet. Um, so it's just going to be uh, me and my good friend, the superhero enthusiast. Hey everybody. So, yeah, uh, we've both seen Guardians of the Galaxy now. Um, just first off, um, Alex, why don't you give uh, everyone your, your general perception of the film overall? I'm assuming everyone out there has seen it because from now on there will be spoilers. <laughs> yeah, that. why else did you click on this video? <laughs> yeah. Um, my initial thoughts were uh, the first time seeing it was just kind of, it was okay. It was not great. It wasn't terrible. Um, I've seen it a second time. And I liked it a lot better second time than I did the first. And some of the issues that I had with it the first time were sort of uh, alleviated or I sort of was able to see things a little bit clearer and kind of how the story worked uh, or was constructed, I guess, to be a little bit more accurate. Um, and I had some issues there, and I still sort of do, but they're a little bit different, um, and some of them are resolved. But overall, I guess, you know, positive, but... I know I'm not big on like rating or ranking things, but you know I'd give it a B. Okay. Um, I did my uh, fresh from the cinema review straight after I saw the movie and uh, uploaded it, and there I said pretty much my feelings were that it's not a terrible movie. I enjoyed myself. Uh, I just didn't leave there with the same wow factor as I did when I went and saw Captain America. So uh, as far as the Marvel Cinematic Universe goes, this year this was um, the second best movie I've seen from the, that studio, so mm -hmm. to speak. So uh, I would definitely put it above Spider-Man, <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man 2 um, in that regard. So I'd say Overall, out of the cinema, movies I've seen at the cinema, probably third or fourth, uh, as far as enjoyment factor goes. It's just uh, I don't know whether to put it above, uh, above or below Three Hundred Rise of an Empire, because <laughs> mm -hmm. I've only seen like four movies this year. Oh wow! At the cinema. <laughs> um. So. Uh, let's let's get into it. Um, the story starts out in a, quite an emotional place. It like it do, it does do that. It does seem like it's trying to be, in my opinion, more than what it is on screen, which is a basically a uh, good old fashioned uh, sci fi a, adventure piece. Um, but it's it's trying to hit these emotional chords. It's just uh, they don't hit as hard as I think that they want them to, is, is uh, my opinion of that. Um, I definitely felt that way the first time I saw it. Uh, I didn't feel as much that way the second time. I thought, actually, probably the emotional stuff is really, uh, emotional and thematic stuff is the stuff that's the most on point in this film for me anyway. Mm. Like, I, I know what they're trying to do, which is like, when I went, oops, sitting there going... Uh, sitting there the first time watching it going, man, they're, they're really trying. And it's just like, I'm um, not, uh, not feeling it. Uh, that's just me. I was just like, uh, -huh. I, it's, I don't know what it is, but it's like, it's missing some, you know, crucial little ingredient that would just kind of push it over the edge. Mm. Um, and I don't know what that is. And I can't quite put my finger on it, but yeah. It's like there's this weird sort of absence of something. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like it's to me it's forced. Um, it might be it might be the thing. It's forced in there. It's not coming. It doesn't feel like it's coming from anywhere. It's, uh, it feels like we need to. <laughs> you need to know this right now. So we're gonna have have to throw it at you right now. So. Yeah, the movie does a lot of that, and it does a lot of telling rather than showing, 
And that's, mm-hmm. you know, the prime storytelling sin is to, you know, tell instead of show. You should always show instead of tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that that was definitely a big thing that bothered me. It bothered me more the first time than the second time, because I guess the second time I saw some of the other stuff, um, mm-hmm. like emotional, emotionally and thematically that kind of set up stuff later in the movie. And there's a lot yeah. more uh, kind of setting up stuff. Uh, with regards to that, then I definitely realized the first time. Mm. Uh, so I did uh, say it starts off on an emotional note, and that's the one time I think it actually did work, is that um, you see Star-Lord, Peter Quill, as a young man who's ha- having to see his mother die. Um, and he's... Uh, Later on, he runs away um, from it, which any kid would do. It's like your your Mm -hmm. mom's dying, and it's pretty clear that his father's not as emotionally available as his uh, mom is. So he runs off and leaves and then gets kidnapped by aliens. His father isn't there at all. Oh, isn't Um, it? No, that that guy... No, that's. I got the impression that was his grandfather. Oh yeah, that's that's right. I'm sorry, I've only seen it once. <laughs> but yeah, um. So yeah, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, duh, uh, duh, uh, yeah. So it's getting out by aliens, uh, and then we fast forward to him doing the Indiana Jones type thing, but in space with dancing. Yeah, and um. Uh, one thing I got to say though is I do love the the soundtrack to this the and I love the way that they insert that in is there there is actually a reason for why there is we are listening to all this pretty 80s style music which is really cool in my opinion. Yeah, it's well I guess it's more like 70s, um, but yeah, it kind of the movie the early part of the movie when he gets abducted. Um, is in 88, I think they said. Yeah. Um, in the movie. So, yeah, it's more like the idea is his mother's giving him all these tracks that she grew up with. Hmm. So she's kind of passing it on to him. So it's it's yeah. even – it's stuff that's even kind of a little bit retro for him even. Yeah. Um, for those of you uh, that saw the trailer, you know that the uh, – I hooked on a feeling it, it I thought that would be a, a track that would be like more prominent in the movie but it's it's not really there as a big prominent track in the movie. Um yeah I, I see what you're saying um it's just kind of there with the prison scene and it fits in the movie but yeah it's like they they almost play it in the trailer like it is the theme song of the movie. Yeah. And it's not. Yeah. Um so, yeah, uh, eventually, yeah, he does. The, the pr- I like the way that, we're, the, that we are introduced to most of the characters uh, le- uh, later on. It's, uh, we get the bad guy and uh, Zoe Saldana's character. Sorry, I can't pronounce the, the, char- the character's name. She's Gamora. Gamora, yeah. Yeah, I just got to think of that Trek character. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I think she's Cardassian or something. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we got uh, uh, her coming in as uh, one of Thanos' daughters. Uh, not, But not really daughters, because Thanos is Adopted like daughter. pink. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we get uh, him, and then we we're introduced to Groot, Root, and um, Rocket, Rocket Raccoon. Yeah, uh, who do in some ways uh, uh, they're the comic relief, and um, yeah, and they they do a pretty good job. Uh, and then of course, once we get to the prison, we're introduced to Drax the Destroyer, played by. Pro wrestling star Dave Batista, and uh, he hands in a pretty good performance considering who he is, and uh, um, was not 
I wasn't ex- uh, to be honest. I was expecting very little from this. I was expecting uh, pretty much a mute who would just say crush, kill, destroy. <laughs> pretty oh. much throughout the the film, I think that would be pretty much what I was expecting. But he gets some really emotional stuff, and while he <laughs> so you can I can tell he's trying. Uh, but it's well, I think not... it it definitely helps that his character is you know very literal. And yeah. So that that allows him as kind of a non actor or first time actor, um, in a lot of ways to to really get into the role a lot easier because he has less work to do to some degree. But I felt he did a really good job of selling all of his lines. Yeah, it's um, it's just uh, sorry being a wrestling fan. I'm just like that's Batista covered in makeup. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm honestly not too familiar with him from from pro wrestling or anything. So why don't you kind of fill those of us who aren't in on, on sort of what his persona is like in the ring. Well, in the ring, he's very much the big, like big uh, lumbering guy. He was team, uh, teamed up uh, initially with um, uh, a tag team guy by the name of Devon Dudley, who was doing a Reverend type character. He was known as Reverend Devon De- 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 at the time, and they that was his uh like he was his bodyguard for my for very first few things but eventually he hooked up with uh Triple H and became part of the group called Evolution which was like had an established guy and Ric Flair at, in the group along with Randy Orton who's a third generation wrestler and he he ended up being very successful. He's not uh, like I really wouldn't be. He's very generic uh, when it comes to being a wrestler. He's not great uh, in the ring, but he's serviceable. He was really popular. Uh, he was on the pretty much the same level as John Cena as as far as popularity in the current environment goes. So oh, okay, yeah. So this is. Uh, but you think you you think his his kind of person because I mean pro wrestling is kind of their playing characters I guess in that as well yeah um yeah, I'd so say his, it was, him, I'd he's say kind of like the character of Drax yeah so except not taking everything so literal it's just like he <laughs> it was uh he he did said more stuff with his eyes and his look more than anything especially early on and I, was, I didn't he's, he would uh. I think probably the best time he had was definitely working with the late Eddie Guerrero, and unfortunately that was right before um, Eddie died uh, of a heart attack um, due to, the, uh, to uh, behind the scene because of reasons. So yeah, it's just, and I think he was probably able to tap into a lot of that emotion uh, for some of the scenes, but it's. <sighs> It's just really hard for me, being a wrestling fan, to be like, that guy has just Batista covered in makeup. And I love the, the makeup that they put on him. It looks really good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, so... And, uh, of course, him taking everything so literally ha- helps with the comedy in the movie. And that's really... Why would I put my finger on his throat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if it goes over my head, I'll catch it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, so Gamora ends up being the, uh, Princess Leia type to, um, Star-Lord's Han Solo type. So, uh, that relationship in the movie, I sort of saw that, like, that's what they were going for. And I think for the most part, they handled that quite well. Uh, I kind of felt it was unnecessary. Um, it worked all right. I think it's good that they sort of pulled back at a certain point um, and didn't really make that a feature of the film. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'm kind of hoping that they're just, after this movie, they're just sort of friends. They're not an actual couple. Really? I was, uh, I'm not expecting that at all. To be honest, I think they're... At... Probably going to end up together, if not in the next movie. The well, end I'm of the just next saying, movie. hoping because I don't really have any interest in seeing that. Okay, well, 
I don't have a great deal of interest in it. I'm just saying there's probably something that's going to happen and it's probably work out in the end. One thing I do when it's go going back to the movie overall is that I love the way that the movie itself just throws you right into the world. It It's like, this is what the world's, world's like, uh, and it doesn't give you too much too much setup in that that fact. It's just like this. Uh, you can pretty much tell uh, that, that that the character you're seeing at the beginning of uh, when the credits are rolling at the beginning of the film that this is the little kid you saw in the hospital at the beginning. It, it, well, yeah, I mean it, that's obvious. I actually would disagree though about setting the world up i i felt like i really needed a lot more in the beginning to kind of provide context um at a certain point because there's a lot of just hand waving or there will be like one line that says something and mm-hmm. you know a big part of this movie is them trying to prevent the big uh war between uh the Novacore people and uh the kree with ronin leading them and mm-hmm. uh you know, there's a couple lines that are thrown in there, but I don't get to see enough of that or see the conflict or even really be told in in any more detail than just this really straightforward stuff that we get, kind of what this is about uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, what are the consequences. Because, like, again, if we're going to bring up Star Wars, like a good thing that they did in that was uh, to establish that the Empire is evil. I mean, just aside from the aesthetic stuff, which is just obvious from the beginning – um, they blow up an entire fucking planet, and you know it's kind kind of hard to uh, you know like them after that. And uh, Ronan goes around and he does some bad stuff, but it's nothing that's really comparable. They say, oh, he's murdering you know women and children, and he killed Drax's family. But you know, it, we needed a little bit more than what we saw to really buy him as a credible threat, especially mm-hmm. given you know they didn't do too much with him later on in the movie. Yeah, that that was one of the weaknesses I would say. Is definitely they don't uh, like as far as the what, what I meant when I said they throw you in there. They like you get that this is a completely different world sort of thing. This is mm-hmm. space that things. Uh, this is how things are in the, in the world. But they don't tell you certainly enough of why things are happening and why the, the the bad guy is a bad guy sort of thing. Uh, well, yeah, it's like, it's really, it's hand waved with one line and he says like, you know, somebody else, I guess at one point says, he's a Cree fanatic who wants to wipe all of us out. And, you know, he says, oh, well, it's this long history thing between our people and they killed, you know, my father and his father before him and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, <laughs> we need more than that. that yeah. Cause that's just generic villain revenge shit. Yeah. Uh, if you want a great example of how that can kill a franchise, just look at the the Star Trek Generations, uh, Star Trek Next Generations movies. <laughs> um, yeah, no kidding. But yeah, um, I think most of the the uh, other characters that on on the other side of the things are handled really well. Uh, a lot more character stuff than what I was expecting with with Groot and Rocket. Uh, I was expecting them to be purely comic relief, but they do get some emotional stuff to do. Oh, uh, I think they're they're like the almost the mo- the emotional center of the movie. In a yeah. Lot of ways. Um, yeah. No. no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say. Yeah, I was not expecting that at all. Uh, was not expecting so much emotion from the same line being repeated over and over again. I am root. <laughs> but I mean, he says it differently every time, and it's it's always reactive to the situation. So, yeah, um, was not expecting so so much from that. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's Vin Diesel for you. When he gets very little to say, he makes. Uh, makes it sound. I think, so. I think Vin Diesel is a much better actor than people give him credit for being. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just that uh, he doesn't always get a lot to do because he's so much related with those 
Fast and the Furious movies than anything else. Yeah, it's more just the types of movies that he tends to be in are more action kind of yeah. ones. Uh, I, th- I, I, I I do agree with you in that respect. Uh, Zo- Zoe Saldana definitely uh, did a lot more to make me like her this time than she did in the 2009 Star Trek movie. Oh, I see. I didn't really care for her in this movie all that much. I thought she was pretty much oh. just as flat. She was a little bit better. She did, a, like, you have no idea how much I hate that movie and everything <laughs> about it. Uh, but, like, for me to actually tolerate her on screen was a little bit better. But, like, she, she was okay, I guess. Like, there was not much there going on. It's like, like, she, out of the main section of the cast, the, the Guardians themselves, is probably the weakest because it's sort of like there's clearly something going on between Star-Lord and her and there's not a great deal except she's pretty and he's, I guess, cute. <laughs> so they got to end up together sort of thing. Uh, but, yeah, there's uh, not a whole lot there. But, uh, but no, but, you know, at the same time, like they, like I said, they didn't make it the focus of the movie or anything, so. Yeah. Uh, so, like, she's turning on the, the, the main bad guy, so, and she gets thrown the team that way. And it's... <laughs> There's stuff I can, like, be like, eh, I can read a little bit into, but, like... Uh, yeah, me. at certain points, especially with her character, they really expect you to read in, you know, more than I think should be the case. Like, they don't... They, I just don't feel like they give us enough. Mm. Um, like, yeah, we kind of see Thanos isn't a great guy, or at least they say he's not a great guy, because really he just sort of sits in a chair and yells. Um, yeah. And... Yeah, we see that, like, all of these bad guys, yeah, I guess they're bad guys, but, like, I don't know, I don't feel like I know anything about her other than that, like, she just says, um, you know, I'm not on their side, and it's like, okay, like, I need more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, true. Uh, just, like, clearly the guy working with Thanos is a, is a bad guy, because we know, know from that one scene at the end of Avengers that, oh, Thanos, he's a bad guy. He wants to... Uh, he was the main guy behind taking over Earth with Loki, so, and we know Loki's a bad guy, so sort of like... It's... But, I mean, that's the thing, is like Thanos is sort of the big mastermind behind all of this stuff, because it's, he wants to get all of the Infinity Gems. Hmm. Um, and I don't see him really, like, really trying, like, hand me the gem. Uh, that's about yeah. That. But that's the thing, too, is, like, I I think Avengers did it better in that they didn't actually show him in the movie. He was just referenced. And yeah. I think that would actually go a long way towards building up this even bigger mystique for the character. So he's sort of a little bit of a mystery and a little bit intimidating because everybody sort of speaks about him in hushed tones. And... You know, he should be that kind of character, at least in the beginning, because Avengers 3, when he's going to show up, is quite a ways away at this point still. Like, I think if you're going to show him in a movie, you show him in Guardians 2 before that, because that's going to come out before Avengers 3. Yeah. Okay, I can see that that happening. Uh, the We've touched on quite a few characters. One I really want to get onto is Nebula. <laughs> Uh, it's um, played by Karen Gillian, who was in Doctor Who for quite a while, played um, Amelia oh, Pond. Oh, I'm not that far yet. <laughs> yeah, played Amelia Pond. Uh, just, I, I know this will probably be a shock to you, but this is a complete uh, 180 from the character that she plays in Doctor Who. <laughs> oh. Uh, and she actually shaved her head for the role. Um, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, any t- uh, like when Nelly Portman did that for V from Vendetta, I was like, yes, oh, that's showing commitment. Like, mm-hmm. I know it's just hair, but still, it's, it's some people are really attached to it. Um, especially but, I mean, if you have long hair, it's just a case of like it takes a long time for it to grow back. 
Yeah, and yeah, Karen Gillian had quite long hair when she left Doctor Who and <laughs> was obviously heading not directly to this, but over to this. So, yeah, it's um, quite, uh, so she, she did, and I think she's a little bit, I understand her a little bit better than the main guy. Not a great deal, but like... Only slightly. But, yeah, it's just like... She I just... Is, yeah, my thing is, I didn't feel like you needed both her and Ronan in it. Because they're both filling the same role in the story. So, you know, one of them is basically just redundant. Yeah. Because uh, they're both kind of the Darth Vader figure, again, if we're going to make a Star Wars reference. Yeah, um... Yeah, I know. It just says... That's pretty much what the, what a lot of this is. It's it's, it's uh, Star Wars, but it's different <laughs> sort of thing. It's, it's done in a similar style. Uh, so we get uh, thrown in. There's a lot of stuff in this that's eventually thrown out uh, from, from uh, other Marvel properties. Like uh, we meet the Collector again, who was in. Uh, the end scene of Thor to the Dark World. Mm -hmm. So we see him again. Uh, Did you think that he was going to be a much bigger role in the movie than he was? Because I got the impression from all the marketing that he was going to be a bigger deal. Well, I did not see... Like, up after I saw the first trailer, I was like, I don't want to see anymore. So I didn't see it. Well, that's all I watched too. But, you know, I, I remember seeing that and... And, uh, you know, hearing them talk about, oh, Benicio Del Toro's in this movie. And, I mean, they even feature him, you know, like you said, in the post credits scene or, I guess, mid credit scene in Throw the Dark World. So it's like I just got the impression that this guy was a bigger deal than he was in the movie. Yeah. Um, I did, like, when I went and saw it, I barely re – like, I just remembered, oh, I'm hooked on a feeling. Uh, <laughs> pretty much that and the introduction of most of the characters. Uh, I watched uh, I watched the trailer a couple, three times at most, and that was long before even the movie came out. And I was like, "All right, I'm gonna. I once I make the decision, I'm gonna see a movie. I don't really want to watch the trailer over and over again. So, and usually that's like the first main trailer that comes out. I don't. Mm -hmm. That's what usually makes my decision. I thought John C. Riley was gonna be a much be a bigger deal in this because like he's oh yeah i sort of i don't know like i it would have been interesting if they'd sort of played him as this kind of cop character who was sort of chasing them um yeah you know for part of the movie because that was the i know that was the impression that i got too just from seeing that first trailer because they have the lineup of them and that's a great shot but that's not actually technically in the movie they're not all standing beside each other um yeah so the impression that i got was not that this movie was an origin film, which it was. I assumed that they were already a team, and then, you know, they find out they're trying to get this, basically like what happened in, in the actual movie, that they're trying to get the orb thing that turns out to be an infinity gem, and then they get kind of involved in this bigger plot that they need to stop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the other thing, too, is that, that like, when I saw uh, her name prop up on the credits, I was like, oh, that's... A She's in this big deal. Uh, that's a big deal. That's Glenn Close. Yeah, and she has like what, like three lines in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I kind of wonder too, though, like with her and John C. Riley and Benicio del Toro, um, and obviously uh, Karen Gillan with Nebula because she escapes at the end. Um, again, very Darth Vader. -y. Um, uh, all of those people being cast with such, you know, well-known names, I kind of get the impression that we're going to see them again in, you know, whatever the next movie is. Yeah. That's my only understanding of it. And yeah, that was my thing. Uh, this is very, <laughs> quite, uh, really not much, uh, for them to do in the movie, like uh, I was expecting the collector, like the collector guy, 
I was starting to think that he was t- he was going to be uh, like when he opens up the gem and everything. I was like, are they trying to cast him as like he's actually the bad guy? He's working with the like it's sort. Of, I was expecting a twist, but didn't get that. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, no, I kind of uh, agree. Um, like maybe it would have been better if they just kind of focused this a little bit more because. Mm. Yeah, because, like, with Ronan and Nebula and the Collector, it's like there's three villains who all sort of more or less fill the same role in the story. Yeah. And that's just weird and unnecessary and redundant, and it could have been a lot more focused and sort of tight if they hadn't done it that way. Yeah, if they had focused on Roman the entire movie and we got to know him, and why he believes the things that he believes. And then got that, to see him do something really, really horrible. Not just, like, hit a guy in the head. Yeah. And then hear about stuff that he did. Like, again, show, don't tell. Because, mm. I mean, again, Darth Vader, like, um, we see he's the guy who leads the ship that, that captures the Tanda Four at the beginning of the movie, and, like, he's... Okay, yeah, he he doesn't do something that brutal, but he basically just chokes a guy to death and like he yells at him and is super, super intimidating and scary. And then they go blow up a fucking planet. (laughs) Um, You know, they really kind of drive home the point that this guy's, you know, scary, but then there's no, there's no destruction of Alderaan moment in this movie that really sells him as a credible threat beyond just the, Oh, we're really afraid of this guy. He's a Kree fanatic. Yeah. I think they that that's the new ah uh, he's crazy. Uh, excuse for writing. Oh, they're a fanatic. Okay, uh, why? Uh-huh. Yeah. What, what what does it even mean to be a Cree fanatic? Like they don't establish that in the movie. Yeah. Um, like again, Star Wars, like they sort of reference the Force and Vader, and like he's uh you know practices this old school religion, uh, basically, and. Uh, you know, we get really nothing like that for Ronan. And he could have been awesome because he's the, he is an awesome Jack Kirby creation. He's got a killer, distinct look. Um, I love the costume. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, just he wasn't written well enough. One thing one thing I, I will say about this, they put a lot of time and effort into the makeup the, and the costumes and uh, designing the worlds and everything that there is like. Uh, I think... They did a lot of better job of making you feel like you're in an actual world than they did in the Star Wars prequels, and I know that's not saying much, but yeah, um, I would agree with that. Um, there are times when it does feel very, very set bound, and I had the problem yeah. a lot with Thor: The Dark World and the beginning of Man of Steel, as well. <laughs> um, too much CGI stuff can be a problem, and it can be hard to make it seem like it's not on a set. So I don't really yeah. I don't, I don't know what other route to, you know, go or, like, what else to recommend that they do, but... Um... Yeah, I th- my idea is generally, like, make a set in the foreground, computer generate everything in the background. Like Yeah, just like, a digital map painting, basically. Yeah. That's my... It would be my philosophy. Um, part of it, too, was I just didn't care for the cinematography in this movie very much. Um, things were shot from really weird angles a lot of the time. And I had the problem with the Avengers as well. Um, just kind of, it's really weird. And at times, especially with Ronan, like they, the way that they should have always shot him was like looking up at him. But the way that they do it is sort of almost like looking slightly down, and that makes him look smaller and less intimidating. Okay. Um, so it's just kind of like... You can do little camera tricks to to emphasize things in the movie, and it just didn't. I don't feel like they did a good job in that respect. Yeah. Uh. Again, uh, I'm waiting for some deleted scenes and stuff. May exist a certain moment that seems to jump out of nowhere between the fight between Nebula and uh, Zoe Saldana's character. Uh, mm-hmm. So. Yeah, uh, that's that fight was like really tiring. Like I thought they all left together. It's like, well, oh, okay, <sighs> they're fighting now, which is something I wanted to see. But 
like yeah, because they didn't do a good job of establishing Gamora or really the relationship between her and Nebula. Like, there's one line, or like, there are two things in the movie that they kind of do to establish it. One is she looks upset when Thanos calls Gamora his favorite daughter. And then at one point she says, Well, you know, you were my, or the one that I hated the least, um, <laughs> in when they're in space. And uh, that's it. Like, we needed more than that. Again, to go back yeah. to that, we needed more than that. Yep. Sure. Uh, the only excuse I can come up with is they felt that they had to focus on the origin of these guys, which, considering who the guardians, what the the, the universe that the the guardians of the galaxy sort of inhabit, and I mean, we know who Hulk is. We know now who Iron Man is. We know who now who Thor is. And mm. yeah, and we ha- had uh, hadn't really gotten into Captain America's origin really before. So yeah, we all know who those guys are now. Now we got to establish this sort of further off in out of the things uh, guys. So they we kind of probably need to put their origin on screen. Maybe. Um, I mean, you could have told it a different way. Um, like I'm fine with this. I'm like I'm when I say that I was not expecting this. It's not necessarily that it's a complaint, but um, I think it's kind of interesting though that you know they do. Given that this is a team, like Avengers took how many movies to build up to, um, and like this they have to do it all in a single movie. So it's mm-hmm. all, to some degree it's their job's a little bit harder. Yeah, and then you you add on to that the fact that this is not you know a well known established property like even comic book fans myself included didn't know who these people were yeah uh i just remember seeing their appearance in uh that episode of Earth's My, uh, avengers Earth's My yep. heroes that was it i was like and i saw the team and i was like this is going to be like impossible to just to make believable in a movie and i think to a to that uh, they did it quite a good job with the team it's just the the villains weren't really that well taken care of and Gamora was sort of like uh, left out there yeah Uh, Um, they needed to do more for her character because she's a really complex character I mean she has that whole background she says like you know he killed my parents in front of me basically and then tortured me and it's like she doesn't seem and part of it is just the writing. Part of it is, like I said, I'm not a fan of Zoe Saldana as an actor. Um, mm. She just doesn't – when she says that, it's like I don't buy that she's been traumatized by that. Um, she's, again, she's just flat. Is there anyone you would think to cast as Gamora instead of Zoe Saldana? Uh, no, I'm really like the last person to ask about mm. casting because I don't follow actors or anything like that. Um, and yeah, like I get, I get what you're saying. Like, I don't like to criticize things without being able to offer an alternative, but <laughs> I just don't, I don't really follow that kind of stuff. So I don't know. And I feel like in a lot of cases, you know, the people who would be the best for the role are often the last people that you would think of. Um, yeah. cause that's this weird thing where, you know, f- with fan casting, people see an actor do a certain role and they say, wow, that's very similar to this other character that I would like them to play. And then like on one level, it's just weird. Cause it's like, why would you want the actor to just kind of get typecast and do the same thing over again? But mm. it keeps you in this kind of boxed in mindset of, you know, not being open to other possibilities when it comes to casting and, you know, a lot of left field choices, like, you know, Heath Ledger being the prime example turned out yeah. really, really well. Yeah. Well, like, when I heard about him being cast and I saw him on screen, I was like, that's Heath Ledger. <laughs> like, I'd seen, like, I Ned hadn't Kelly. heard who... Yeah, Ned Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> but there's uh, other stuff that he had done before that that you could have probably seen him do at the Jericho. But... Yeah, I guess Ned Kelly had the antagonism towards authority kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing I think they spent way 
way too much time on in this movie yet, though, is the other people uh, that were there. Um, Yon do oh, the the, the other do guy. Why why would why they need to be there? I I agree. Like the more I think about it, the more I think that they should have just been pushed off to the second movie, more or less. Like because Yondu is almost again. Again, with the freaking Star Wars references, he sort of set up like Jab of the Hutt. Like, you hear about Jab of the Hutt in A New Hope when Greedo, you know, confronts Han. And he's like, you owe money. And uh, that's just a little sort of dangling blot thread that sets something up. And just even if Star Wars had only been in that movie, that's all we would have, necess- like, really needed. Um, and we don't need that. Yeah, Added in scene. For yeah, I was going to say, then the special edition shoved in that scene, which I guess they did film back then, but it just, it's unnecessary. It it just slows everything down. And, uh, yeah, it's a lot of the same stuff we heard with Greta. Yeah, exactly. Um, it just repeats the same stuff. And here, I just feel it serves like more of a distraction because, um, you know, he doesn't really offer a whole lot like you could have done the same thing so like they come in in the third act and help them out but you could have just played that differently and had them team up with just the nova core and still had it work more or less the same yeah it's just kind of more like we said before just kind of like redundant stuff sort of shoved in here when it, it's clear that it's kind of for setup or in this case maybe even would have worked better just in the next movie period yeah, like, uh, for some reason, Star Lord just gets frozen in carbonite and gets taken off. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird. That would, that would be too on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, but, uh, I think overall we've pretty much covered the movie. Like, is there any other moments you think we should mention? I loved the bar scene, um, because it, it showed us a lot about all of the different characters. It showed us with Star Lord and Gamora. We saw that, you know, he's who he was. Um, you know, he's this guy who's trying to be heroic and kind of is, but then he he tries to point out that he's heroic, and then that completely undermines his heroism. Um, Gamora, we see that she, uh, you know, had a certain upbringing, so she's not exposed to certain things like dancing, and she kind of wants to give into that sort of thing, but like it's totally against her programming. Um, when we're seeing the animal fights, we see Groot look at it, and uh, he's just... Well, I mean, there's the scene earlier where he grows the flower for the little girl, which is really sweet. Um, mm-hmm. And then he gets totally upset when he sees the one animal eat the other one. Um, Drax, we see, is pre- he's pretty simple, has simple tastes. And uh, mm-hmm. then Rocket gets drunk, and he's, you know, really complaining about, like, you know, I didn't ask for any of this to be done to me. And we see why he is, he's so antisocial and so harsh and so insulting to everyone. Because uh, it's just you know a defense mechanism, and so they do a really good job in that that whole kind of larger scene when they're at uh, nowhere, the big dead celestial. Yeah, head, um, yeah I think really establishing all the characters. I think that's probably one of the best parts of the movie is that, uh, any everything that takes place in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> um, one thing I guess. I also want to criticize. I I totally neglected to bring this up in my own podcast on the show, um, or on this movie, uh, was that it's really really weird that there's a desegregated prison. Um, that's totally bizarre to me, and I'm really really surprised that, like, I get that she's a badass warrior chick and whatnot, but and could probably take out a lot of those guys, but really. Like, fuck, she, to be honest, like, she would be, you know, gang raped and murdered within, like, 30 seconds of her walking in there. <laughs> if it was a real prison. Yeah. Um, that's the whole thing, too. Like, that prison seems very, very casual <laughs> as far as prisons go. Yeah, I think, it, I think though, it's it's in a world where they, like, lock you up and they don't think about you. <laughs> but, yeah, that's something weird. I thought, uh, I was like, yeah, this is pretty weird, but... Yeah, well, and what's you know what's person. weirder that she's the, like the only woman there. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's like, do they not have another the holding place for like female criminals? Because that's a thing. Um, 
I guess the other thing too was that they say that the Nova Corps are like corrupt and then we don't actually see that. It's just sort of a hand wavy line that makes it okay for our heroes to like kill them. And I don't think that that's really all that great. Like they should have done a better job of establishing, you know, who they are, why are they corrupt? What's happened there? Um, and, uh, I mean, maybe that could have even played into Ronin's whole motivation, too, is like he sees the Nova Corps, who are these space police guys, as totally corrupt. Um, and, and, you know, his fanaticism is like, no, we need real justice, not whatever this is. Mm-hmm. Um, they could have played it that way, and that, that would have worked a lot better. Yeah. Uh, one last thing. The, I guess, after credit scene, we get to see a character that I never thought we'd see again. <laughs> Oward the Duck. <laughs> that took me totally by surprise. <laughs> uh, like, because uh, uh, I was first, I was like, who's talking to that? Howard the Duck? <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> okay, uh, we're acknowledging Howard the Duck's existence. Okay, that's weird. That's bizarre. Yeah, that's, so. that's almost misstep number one. Um, <laughs> just acknowledging that he exists and that movie exists, but um, uh, yeah, I, was you know, I thought it was funny. Yeah, so did I. Uh, but yeah, that's the only other thing I wanted to mention. So, uh, I I put that up there is like just purely like as like one of the best thing is like uh, as like I do do like. Thanos is one I like. My, I I thought the one for Captain America, like the after credit scene, like after all the credits was done, that one was like. Um, oh, the one that's kind of the setup to Avengers. Uh, not the not the, not that one. The one where you oh, just Winter say. Oh, Winter Soldier, you mean? Yeah, Winter Soldier. I thought that was like, yeah. All the ones for that actually set up Avengers, they they were all pretty necessary, but. The, it just yeah. seems like lately there's like let's just throw something on at the end. <laughs> but then and, I mean we didn't kind of did the same thing too with the shawarma scene um, at the end of Avengers like the the tail and actual after credit one not the mid credit scene um, mm. and that's kind of like they've been been doing this for all of Phase One at that point and they make a big deal about it. They get people to stay. And then it's just like, it's a silly kind of almost throwaway joke. And it it sort of subverts the whole thing that they've been doing. So yeah, kind of adds another layer of humor to it. Yeah. I just thought it was like, "Mm." uh, like the only one I think they haven't done that. No, no, they guess they did it in Thor as well. No, it's because he just shows back up. Anyway, Uh, (laughs) yeah what was that about (laughs) yeah I thought it was the mid one seems to be like okay we want to keep everyone here in in, till the end now so like here's the the setup for the next Mm -hmm. movie but then they show the joke at the end and it's like "Mm." so I think that's a good way of doing it like okay we we want we want you to stay and watch these amount of credits, but no, you know we don't want you waiting in there till the end. So yeah, mm-hmm. uh, we did get a Stanley cameo, and I thought, okay, that's he. He shouldn't have been in the movie because he had nothing to do with the Guardians of the Galaxy. He didn't know who the Guardians of the Galaxy were. Um, that's totally weird and unnecessary. Yeah, um... but you know, Stanley's a fame whore, so. <laughs> Yeah, I could tell that when I went and saw him at, at uh, Supernova, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think we're going to be putting up with him <laughs> uh, too much longer. Uh, that, not to say that Stanley's a bad guy. Like, I didn't get the impression, though, like, that he was a bad a bad guy. Like, it's just Well, like, it's mixed. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, like, uh, like I don't know the entire history him like in order to get to that position you probably have can't always be the nicest guy possible so yeah um i didn't get the impression though that when i saw him that oh it's, it's a terrible person i shouldn't want to 
know anything about uh, about him. But yeah, it's sort of like they call him up and he's have a cameo, and he's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't think it's the other. I don't necessarily think it's the other way around. Or he. Or did he have it written in that he must have a cameo in every single Marvel movie? Who knows, even at this point. Yeah, so, anyway, though, I didn't, I think, uh, I think all around, though, it was an all right movie. I just don't think it blew me away as much as I wanted it to be. Yeah, there's certain, like, like I said, the, the emotional and thematic stuff was totally on point. The story construction and plot stuff was not. Um, yeah. So it's just kind of a little bit half and half, but for me, I guess now after a second viewing, kind of the emotional thematic stuff has hit me hard enough that I'm able to overlook some of the story stuff a little bit more. Yeah, from a purely entertainment sense, uh, pure like if I'm going to sit down and watch a movie, yeah, I can do that with this. I don't. Need, uh, it doesn't necessarily turn my brain off. So uh, I think. Overall, it's overall it's a pretty good movie. I just don't think it blew me away as much and made me think as much as Winter Soldier did, or as much as Days of Future Past did. Mm. Um, so, um, but it's also a different kind of movie from those as well. So, yeah, and I was expecting that. I was just hoping for something a little better than what I got, but I. Oh, not really. Like, I wasn't expecting that much out of it. It was like, um, the trailer really sold me on this action-adventure thing, and I I enjoyed the ride. I just, I've been on better rides before. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good way to put it. <laughs> Metaphor. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there anything else you want to say before we finish up here? No, I think we hit all the deals. Mm, uh, okay, um, just quickly, uh, what would you... Uh, favorite line of the movie? Maybe? Um, it's got to be the "if it goes over my head, I'll catch it" thing. Uh, I, I think so. Uh, I think it was uh, the same scene. It's like I do have a plan. <laughs> yeah, twelve twelve percent of one. And, <laughs> or I guess the other Drax line that I found really funny was the, you know, when did we establish that? And like just a minute ago, was like, oh, I wasn't listening. I was, you know, I was thinking of something else. <laughs> Because we've all had that kind of a moment, haven't we? <laughs> all right. Um, I guess we'll be back uh, again pretty soon. Uh, probably late, depending on when I upload it, it's the next thing I will have Steve on for Tomorrow When the War Began, my favorite movie. So I'm going to be kind of probably be like, no, you're totally wrong. That's <laughs> this movie's perfect. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Uh, no, I can probably take uh, most of the criticisms for that. But um, so please uh, uh, stay on, hit that subscribe button, guys, because it really does help. Uh, and the more you guys watch me, the more I'll, more I'm, I will do. 